Christianity suit it was a very um, sober, if not somber, assessment of what exactly we can do. Actually, I find in both your presentations uh, a very interesting absence. You don't really mention the military interventions undertaken by European states, if not by the EU, in Libya and in Mali, which, when they were happening, were promoted as examples of, yes, Europe can. We don't really need to follow the Americans. We can act in our immediate neighborhood. We can do things. Um, nor the cockiness that our part of Europe, and this country especially, showed when it comes to, oh, we know democratic transitions. I mean, this is something we're good at. We can teach you how to do it. Um, Poland tried to export its democratic expertise to um, Tunisia, Libya, Egypt. In Tunisia, um, Le Valenza was boycotted by the trade unions because he had betrayed socialism. Um, in Egypt, um, the scale of the problems was so baffling that Egyptian interlocutors rather promptly lost interest in what Poles can offer. Martin, do you think there still is um, a scope for European, if not EU, security intervention in the processes in North Africa, or have we learned the limits of our limited power? Is there anything that um, Europe can export there in terms of competence in democratic transitions? Or is it also, uh, for once, a, a case where we've lost a good opportunity to shut up? <laughs> there was no sarcasm by all but, uh, uh, Well, um, really, the response to that is uh, yes and no. Uh, I mean, I would say that uh, um, we really get very much caught up in, in, in the rhetoric that we must do something. Uh, whereas sometimes it would be best if we did nothing. And that would actually be better for the people on the ground. Uh, and uh, that, uh, I bet perhaps not a fashionable thing to say, but that's, uh, that is the case. But sometimes when our own interests are in danger, uh, of course that our intervention is justified. Uh, but only then, I would say. But going back to the, uh, um, you know, to the very issue that, that we have here in, in the title, and uh, I will touch very much on, uh, on your on your question, Kostek, in, in, in three points I will make. Uh, they will be very, very brief, just uh, I'll say a few words on uh, how I see the EU policy on the ground there. Uh, I will say even uh, about uh, what, uh, uh, what the policy actually should be there in terms of also interventions that you mentioned uh, and what kind of long-term approach we can, uh, we can hope to, to, to have uh, in, in the region. Uh, and like I said, we, we should be uh, very brief, and because uh, I'm very keen to uh, look forward, uh, I'm very keen to hear uh, your views from uh, from the audience on that. Um, I think it's always fashionable for to, for for a think tanker to say that uh, EU policy has been a failure, uh, and it hasn't worked out. It's been a disaster, and, and so on. And I I wish I could have uh, you know done, denied this conventional uh, wisdom. In, in, when it comes to North Africa, it's very difficult to do so. Uh, and I will try to be gentle here. I'll just say um, it hasn't been successful. Um, in, in many respects, it really couldn't be very any different because the complexity of the situation on the ground is, is very dire. Uh, and uh, the nature of the EU as a foreign policy actor is, is very incoherent. Uh, it's not really... Uh, a unified foreign policy actor, a, even a unified foreign policy actor, which is the United States, has not been successful, has not been more successful than we have been, uh, in some respects, actually less so. Uh, so sometimes, you know, you just have to a little bit, but you, you can't really do that much. You know, that's, uh, that, that seems to be the, uh, uh, what, what we might have learned from that. Um, what have we done wrong? I think we, we all know that. Um, until the Arab Spring, we have supported authoritarian regimes. Uh, we have ignored human rights violations, which have been enshrined in our, uh, uh, in our treaties, in our agreement, with the uh, bilateral agreement with the nation of North Africa, and we just decided to close our eyes on the fact that uh, that wasn't respected. 
After the Arab Spring, we have accepted and in some cases even supported the Islamic parties coming to power, and they came to power everywhere where you had the election. Uh, and as we see now, after these um, pluralistic democratic elections, if we can call them like that, uh, the situation is not more, more stable than it was before. Uh, in some respects, it is less stable. Uh, and uh, with respect to human rights, um, again, uh, we have some huge improvements here because you know people, uh, you have more freedom of speech, but you continue to have human rights violation in the region. Uh, it still continues to be the case. Um, so um, I think overall that before the revolutions we have done too little. Uh, after the revolution broke down, we have done too much. Um, the Libya operation was militarily very successful. In terms of making Libya a more stable place, I'm not sure, quite sure that that has been delivered, or is likely to be delivered over the period of the next few years. Uh, and the question which will come up with that is, do we really think that arms delivered to the rebels in Syria will make a situation, will end human suffering? Uh, I, I have my doubts whether that would improve the stability and uh, humanitarian situation on the ground in Syria. Obviously, I know this is a very complicated question. Uh, this is not only about human suffering, but I don't think that it will help out in that respect. Um, I think basically that we need to live with the fact that the region, North Africa and Sahel, will, is and will remain unstable. Um, we will not succeed in stabilizing it from Europe. We will not succeed to stabilize it from the United States. Um, we may succeed in turning it into a bigger mess it is if we uh, continue to have this kind of knee-jerk interventions determined by our domestic politics. Um, and I think that we really do the biggest favor to the region and to ourselves if we decide to forget about spreading enlightenment in the world and concentrate instead on, the, on our own interests. And what are our most fundamental interests in the region? Our most fundamental interest in the region is to protect our own citizens. Uh, and which, on occasion, uh, may require that we intervene. Uh, as we, or rather the, the, the French, have done by intervening in, uh, in Mali, which I think was, uh, 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 at least in the initial stages, was a very much uh, a needed operation at this point. Um, the, as long as the aim of the operation is to prevent uh, an emergence of threat to Europe, to the European homeland, and the protection of European interests, we have a duty to intervene. If it's the case of the prevention of the emergence of terrorist camps, which could be a threat to us, then this is what we should do. Um, but we should not meddle in installing this or that government, in promoting that or that political parties, we may fail, sometimes we may not fail, we may install, install the government, then we will end up in owning a problem with that this government would create, uh, which might happen in Mali, frankly, quite soon. Um, good governance, stability are not really the results of uh, foreign interventions. They may actually delay uh, the moment when the nations decide to take uh, matters in their own hands, uh, and, uh, and, and hence foreign interventions may be counterproductive in that respect. The radical elements, they need to get the message from us that we will not tolerate a threat, uh, current threat or potential threat to European homeland or to European interests in the region. And this is the size we should go. Uh, and uh, experience shows that when we try to do more, we don't succeed. Uh, and we are not really helping the people on the ground. So, uh, what, what kind of nicer long-term approach we might have here, because I realize that what I just said is not particularly nice, so let's try to say some nicer things. Uh, other than a prevention of a threat to Europe, um, we need a long-term approach which should be based on the recognition that stability and the rule of law 
does not happen overnight, but they could be, things could be uh, done to, uh, to help it happen. Um, the empowerment of youth, the promotion of women's rights, these are obvious things. Uh, the programs like that have been in existence for many years. The problem with, the program, uh, with, with these programs are that they are not very well targeted. <coughs> very often they are being um, owned and promoted by former colonial powers. Um, and uh, because they have an interest there, but also because they care. Uh, so there are two sides of the coin here. Uh, and that is good that they care, it's good that they do that. On the other hand, they sometimes lack credibility because they are former colonial powers. Uh, and this is where I see roles, uh, role for nations like, uh, like this one. I think it would be a, a healthy situation when nations like Poland would get more involved. Uh, we have no colonial experience, uh, no colonial legacy, uh, but we do have a, a recent experience of successful transition uh, and we have a socio-economic structure which is more comparable with the nations of the, of the region than uh, most of West European uh, uh, nations are. Um, but for that to happen, two things must, uh, uh, must be fulfilled. I mean, first of all, the former colonial powers should make a space uh, for those uh, <coughs> nations like this one. But also nations like this one must become more uh, seriously interested in the region. Uh, so far, uh, these two conditions remain to be fulfilled, I'm afraid. Okay, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Nancy. I do unhappily agree with your assessment of EU policy, and um, the terms you used make me think of the opening sentence of Emperor Hirohito's speech to the nation in August 45, which were the course of military operations has not necessarily turned in our favor. Um, having said that, um, you have stressed that um, EU policies have not been supportive of stability, uh, which is true. But okay, the stablest place on earth is a cemetery. The second best is a good dictatorship. Uh, I'm not really sure that we should be supporting this kind of stability. In fact, we're not. Even the programs that you mentioned, like um, women's rights, there is nothing more subversive <coughs> than empowering women, including in this country, incidentally. <laughs> but um, it reminds me of an American cartoon which said what should have been the American demand to the ta of the Taliban after 9-11. They should have put an ultimatum. Give us Bin Laden or else we will send your woman to college. <laughs> um, there is no safe med meddling in the affairs of other countries, and there are no countries who are safe from meddling in an interconnected world. I would love to have a debate with you on that, but that will have to wait for another time. In the meantime, the floor is open for a debate between you and our panelists.